tempted to eat the forbidden fruit, yeah? She, do welcome, do come and have a seat. Eve is tempted to grasp the apple, which she's not allowed to eat. And then she gets Adam alongside, and he's tempted to, 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 to grasp that forbidden fruit. And this seems to symbolize the, the lust was the word we had in that reading there, the deep desire that we as human beings, as fallen human beings, have to control everything, to grasp everything. Yes, even knowledge itself we want to have control of. And when we fall into this grasping, it robs us of joy, and we're then not able to give away freely and joyfully. It seems that in our fallen human nature, there is this desire to possess and to control. And somehow, we've got to relearn how to be human beings, how to share, how to give away in a joyful spirit. All too easily, we find ourselves thinking, this is my car, this is my kitchen, this is my cupboard, this is my bank account, this is my house, my patch of land, my country, keep out, my nation, my territory, this is my life, this is my career, my job, my ministry, my income, my children. I want control over all of that hands off. Do you notice how when that spirit gets a hold of us, and it gets a hold of all of us, doesn't it, at times, then we lose the joy, we lose the freedom, and we find ourselves captive as Adam and Eve were captive to their temptation. A moment in, in my own past captures it rather poignantly when about 20 years ago, um, Margaret and I were on a holiday in her parents' house, and we needed an extra suitcase to pack up all the stuff that Margaret's mother was giving us to take back to Scotland. And I went, I went up into the, uh, the loft of the house, and uh, uh, I came down with a, an old suitcase, and Margaret, Margaret's late father said, he was so annoyed, he was so angry, he said, Nimm aus! Nimm einfach aus! which means, in English, take everything, just take everything. And it was an old dusty suitcase, and I thought, what's going on here? I don't get this. But he just found it so hard to let go, and it was as though he could see everything was going to be snatched away from him, which was not the case. The fist tightens. Take your left hand. Open, take your hand, left hand. Just turn it into a fist. This symbolizes the desire to grasp, whether it's the apple or whether it's something else in your life you're grasping hold of that you're not supposed to have or not supposed to hold on to in that way. And the moment of grace comes when we grasp at the deepest possible level that everything that we have comes from the Lord in the first place. Absolutely everything that is in existence is a gift from him. And then when we open that grasp and release it and say, thank you, we're able to give back to God what is his. Lord, all that I have is yours, for of your own do I give you. We release it and give it back. And then grasp becomes gift. And this is a moment of spiritual transformation. And the first fruit of this spiritual transformation, when we move from grasp to gift, is joy. Inner joy. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. That's what he's looking for. God looks on at givers, and he sees two types of givers. He sees the reluctant giver, who momentarily releases, opens the grasp of their hand, and lets it go, and then immediately wants to cling back what is released. That's the one type of giver, the reluctant giver. And then there's the other type of giver, the joyful giver, who lets it go, releases it to God. A whole new way of life then opens up in that moment. 
This is never better captured than by Jesus in his words on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 3, when he says this. He says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Yeah? And I've kind of got this feeling, I'm working on this, that the left hand is the one that grasps and wants to control, and the right hand is the one that releases. So don't let that left hand, that greedy, grasping hand, know what this right hand is trying to do. Put it behind your back <laughs> so that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, says Jesus. It's interesting that in some languages the, you, the, the, there's a, some stigma attached to the left hand, the sinister hand, the sinistre. I think in some cultures it's the hand that you use when you go to the loo. I'm not sure about that. Is that right? Um, anyway, don't let your left hand, says Jesus, know what your right hand is doing. Left hand, the grasping, jealous hand. The right hand, the releasing, joyful hand. And with this redeemed giving, there is a kind of holy naivety. A, a sort of naive abandon. A kind of letting go and not counting the cost. In the eyes of the wisdom of this world, this is folly, just giving away like that. It's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. Your accountant will be at your door saying, what are you doing? But in the economy of the kingdom of God, this releasing, this holy folly, is some, the very thing that brings joy. And Jesus picks up this theme again and again in the Sermon on the Mount. Read it when you get home, chapters 5 to 7 of Matthew's Gospel. If anyone wants to sue you, and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well, he says. Just let it go. The left hand grasps, stores up treasures on earth against the rainy day. Have you got a loft that's full of stuff like Margareta and I? A loft packed full of stuff? Are you wondering how you can store all your things in your house? Have you accumulated lots of stuff for the rainy day or for posterity? Well, meditating on this, I've had an idea, a crazy idea. What would happen if we all emptied our lofts and all our store places of all the things that we don't really need, that we're storing up, we brought it all to church and we took it all to a car boat cell and sold it and gave the money away. What a crazy idea. Go on, shoot it down in flames. But why not? I've got a loft full of stuff. I've got to get rid of it fairly soon. I won't, you know, be moving into a new house at some point, eventually into an old people's home. There won't be a loft there for me, you know. How about it? Let it go. Who's got a loft full of stuff? Okay, not a, not a few of us. Okay. <laughs> Crazy idea. Why am I storing all this stuff up? Mad. I've emptied lots of lofts in my time. I don't want to have to anybody to have to empty my loft. And releasing it, releasing this stuff as an act of worship, a byproduct of an empty loft. But your left hand doesn't know what you're doing. Not many of us are on the bread line here in church this morning, but it's true, isn't it, that a lot of us are anxious, anxious people, caught up in one kind of worry or another. And here Jesus talks about this with his timeless wisdom, puts the finger on it, Matthew chapter 6. Here we are, verses 25 to 27. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, 
has a single hour to your life. The crowds were amazed at this kind of teaching. They were enthralled by this simple wisdom. But I think that the thing that captivated them most of all must simply have been the quality of Jesus, that, that this quality of joy that he had, this, this infectious joy that he had. And interestingly, when we come into John's Gospel and, and round about chapters 16, 17, Jesus is starting to say, my joy is complete My joy is complete. Why is his joy complete? He says, all I have is yours to the Father, to his Father. All I have is yours and all you have is mine. So there's this wonderful sharing that's going on, this open-handedness between Father and Son. And then Jesus prays that they, all of us lot, that they may um, be full of the measure of joy my joy, Jesus' joy, that is within them. The, the joy that he and the Father enjoy in all eternity in sharing everything with each other becomes our joy too. If Jesus wants us to release our grasp, it's so that our joy might be complete. He the eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ, had all the riches of heaven. He tells us that he could have called on 12 legions of angels at his arrest to prevent the arrest. He is the one who's in the very form of God himself and yet becomes obedient to the will of his Father and is even willing to let go of the temptation to grasp onto his life and cling onto it. Rather, he, he, he's, he releases it. And he becomes obedient, even to death on a cross. In the very heart of Jesus, very heart of the person of God, is this joy that comes through the willingness to let go of absolutely everything, even life itself. Naked, I came into the womb. Naked, I shall depart says Job. God, you see, is in the facts. And the facts release us, and the facts release joy. And the fact is, we did come into the world naked, and we will leave it naked. Everything we have comes from God, and joy, therefore, is released when we just release what we have, and we're called to give away. The, um, the other day, I was having my sixth tooth of the year extracted. And this lovely young Asian dentist that I have over in Stopsley, um, I said to her, um, <clears throat> what's going wrong? And she said in a very compassionate way, well, they, they've, they've done good service for you. They've had their day. So she pulled out this huge great molar about 10 days ago, and says, do you want to see it? So they often ask you this, dentist, don't they? So um, I looked at my molar, which clearly had, passed, had its best day, passed its sell-by by date. And, um, and I thought, well, that's a bit of me, isn't it? There's a bit of me that's died there. <laughs> There's more bits of me that are going to die, and there will come a, a, a day when... All the bits of me that you see now will have had passed their sell-by date. That's okay. And seeing a bit of me there on the dentist tray was actually sort of helpful in a way to get in touch with my mortality. I have to let this go. It's good and healthy. And actually, I felt a joy in my spirit to watch. That's okay. I've lost six teeth. There's more to come. That's all right. Um, let it go. Are you with me? It's, if you're sort of under 40, you probably think, what on earth is this old man on about? But, but if you're kind of 60 plus, then you think, well, yes, I know what he's talking about. But, it, well, yes, 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 I, I know, I'm, 
I, I, have, I have said to my lovely dentist, um, I'm having a bit of trouble eating now. With, you know, there's certain things I can't eat anymore. Was it, we could talk about dentures. <laughs> Perhaps some of you got some ideas. But God loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. He loves it when we give away cheerfully and joyfully everything, including our lives it's, uh, it, uh, themselves. Of course, the temptation is to think by taking out dental insurance, you've got it all covered, and it's not going to come your way. But <laughs> you might get the money back for the treatment, but you don't get the tooth back. No insurance can save my teeth. No insurance can save my life other than the investment in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who poured out his blood on the cross that I might have not just a bit more life now, but actually eternal. It's quite cool, isn't it, really? Most of our anxiety comes from fear. Fear that we're going to lose control. Left-handed living, grasping. The truth is, my friends, we are going to lose control. John, chapter 21 and verse 19. Sorry, verse 18. We are going to lose control. And Jesus tells Peter at the end of his life, the end of Jesus' life, before Jesus is about to go back to heaven, he tells Peter that he will lose, he, Peter will lose control of his life. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Tradition holds it that Peter was taken away and um, martyred for his faith. I think crucified, wasn't he? Upside down, is that right? That's the tradition. Not many of us will follow that precise death, but the truth is, my friends, that most of us will go be taken away into a home and other people will dress us. That's happened to all my, both my parents and both my parents-in-law. And we will be taken to this place where we don't really want to go and we will have our hands lifted up and be dressed. It's probably coming all, most of our ways. Yeah? You know, this giggling going on, it's funny, isn't it? But, you know, it's true, isn't it? It's true. And it's very healthy to face these facts. I'm not just saying this because I'm 62. I wouldn't have preached this 20 years ago. But um, it's actually very healthy to face that and to be willing to release our lives and our futures into God's hands. Not just... Ugh, I don't want to go there, you know. I remember in my master parish, some, some of the younger mothers used to say, old people's homes, I'm not doing that. No, we're not doing that, are we? But actually, it is possible to release one's life into God's hands joyfully. One's gift on our gift day in two weeks' time. One week's time, well done, great. And whatever else, our lofts, whatever else we might be called on to give. So that we become new, regenerated people of God. Not like the first Adam who clung to life, yeah? But the second Adam, Jesus Christ, who was willing to give it all, including his very life, away. Those are the two ways of living. Just a further thought, picking up on the sense that Andrew and I had a, earlier in the service and that, that actually Ted then unfolded in that reading from his scripture notes. The sense that there may be some of us here this morning who really are clinging on to things that may actually be very unhelpful, very damaging, yeah, in our lives, whatever it may be. The word lust was mentioned there. But clinging on to things which are really damaging and harmful. 
And I want to say to you, if, you know, if, if, you've, if that applies to you, the thing to do is to make yourself accountable to somebody else over this. Make yourself accountable. Go to that person and say, needs to be a trusted person, a strong person, who will, you can say anything to, and just say, I want to make myself accountable to you, and I want you to ask me every week or even every day how I'm getting on with this thing I'm grasping that I shouldn't grasp. Leave that with you. When we release it, in comes the joy. The Lord loves a cheerful giver.